Hello, I'm John Greening, uh, and I'm in my study in Cambridgeshire, the Word House, as my friend Stuart Henson called it. Uh, we live in a little terrace cottage, and we ran out of space when our second daughter arrived. Um, and now I do most of my work out in this in this Word House. So here's where uh, I've been editing Ian Crichton Smith, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But um, the context is that we came here 1983 from northeast Scotland where we've been teaching Vietnamese refugees after some time in Egypt before that um, and it was only a short while before we came here that I actually heard Ian Crichtonsmith reading for the one and only time um, at Dundee and that was through Douglas Dunn who ran a reading series there uh, and we had actually been going to launch my new book, my first book, Westerners, there at the same event with Ian Crichton Smith. That didn't happen because the book wasn't out in time, which was rather sad. But at the same time, it would have diluted what was a really important event uh, in March of 1982, because that was Ian Crichton Smith's second selected poems. He'd had one 1970 from Victor Galantz. Uh, but this was was a particularly notable event. There was another selected in 1985 from Karkinet, and the one I'm editing now is, is the first for 35 years, so quite important. But uh, So here's where all that work has been going on. Um, I was, when we arrived here, I was coming to be a school teacher. And Ian Crichton Smith had only recently retired from school teaching himself. It always interests me people who sort of managed to juggle those two jobs. In fact, poets who have nine to five non-poetry jobs interest me. Dana Joyer, Dennis O'Driscoll and so on. Uh, so I was starting teaching and he just finished teaching. Um, it's warm in here. There's many books as you can see, thousands of the things, music. Um, it's a little retreat for me. Uh, and here's where most of my poetry collections have been written. This is where all my reviewing has been done, all my reading has been done, a lot of time spent here during lockdown as you could imagine. Um, and here's where I spread out all those many collections of Ian Crichton Smith. He was such, here they all are, look, he was such a prolific poet and I had to select from these. Uh, there's already been a rather magnificent, two rather magnificent collectives from Carcanet in 2011 and that earlier selected that lovely red um, selected in the signature series poetry signature series so i was reading all these and that's what i've been doing out here preparing for deer on the high hills which is what we call the new selected from perhaps in Crichton smith's best poem he thought it was his best poem deer on the high hills um how did I go about it, apart from reading all the books again? Well, a lot of annotation, going through and deciding what he liked when he was putting together his own selections, but also what other people have liked. Um, but what I discovered as I was going through it, but he was such a prolific poet that a lot of the pieces he wrote didn't actually end up in the new collected at all. So I've been working out where they are to be found and putting together a new kind of collection, a new angle, I think, on Ian Crichton Smith. Um, more international in perspective, probably. Uh, he, Douglas Dunn considered him a European poet above all, obviously a, a very considerable poet in Scotland itself. And he, he certainly sort of studied in schools regularly his, his novel, Consider the Lilies. And he, he was a great novelist, a very prolific novelist in two languages, Gaelic and English. Um, playwright, short story writer, his collected short stories are magnificent. But it's as a poet that, that I'm interested in him. Um, and he wrote a lot. He discarded a lot. And I suspect he lost a lot and, and probably forgot what, <laughs> what he produced, which is why I've, um, I've had such fun discovering what's out there and this is not even looking at I'm sure there must be all kind of manuscripts that I haven't even tackled um, 
because he prefers to throw something away rather than uh, rework it, uh, sometimes there's a kind of improvised feeling to the poems, and they're a bit hit and miss at times, uh, but that gives them a unique uh, freshness, I think. Um, perhaps I should read uh, one of the later poems. This, this is from Ends and Beginnings, one of his last Karkonet books. And he liked writing poems about the process of writing poetry. So this is typically understated, informal, thrown away almost, uh, rather than the strict metres he tended to use in his earlier work, simply, simply called poetry. Poetry has nothing to do with who we are. It cannot be explained by biography, e.g. sickness, unhappiness, Poetry is a swart planet with which we are in touch, from which we receive at certain times messages. Nor is it a black or emerald clock. I think it is a voice which speaks to us at night as unquiet trembling, or maybe a curious arrangement of stones, poorly random and yet sonorous, a packet of crisps beside a Greek vase on a day with a breeze flowing from the south. It could be his aesthetic in many ways, the packet of crisps beside a Greek vase. Um, so that's quite a late poem. This one's much earlier, called Two Girls Singing. It's a bit of a debt to um, words with Solitary Reaper, I think. Quite a few literary references in his poetry, though you wouldn't think of him as a literary poet at all. Two girls singing. It neither was the words nor yet the tune. Any tune would have done and any words any listener or no listener at all. As nightingales in rocks or a child crooning in its own world of strange awakening or larks for no reason but themselves. So on the bus through late November running by yellow lights tormented, darkness falling, the two girls sang for miles and miles together. And it wasn't the words or tune, it was the singing. It was the human sweetness in that yellow, the unpredicted voices of our kind. 